Hey everybody, welcome back to number one leading ladies. You know me, Kaylee McMahon, and my podcast is By Women for Women, where we focus on bringing each other up instead of tearing each other down. Today we have a special guest, Jennifer Grimson, and she is going to introduce herself because I won't do her justice. Go ahead, Jennifer, introduce herself. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Jennifer Grimson. I have a podcast called the Micro Empires Podcast. And in a nutshell, my story, uh, I have a long story as we all do, but is that I lost everything twice. Uh, no home, no job, no car, no place to live, no money, two kids to raise and chapter 13 bankruptcy because it wasn't as much fun the first time. So I did that twice. And the second time I realized I needed to rebuild in a way that nobody could take it away. And so my idea was small pockets of wealth, however you define wealth, to provide me with security. I did that in four years. I created $1.4 million in income producing investments. Um, And I did that with a W-2 and some grit. And what really got me to start the podcast was I, I got really angry that these tools were available to everybody and that I didn't know about them and that uh, that there's always tools available to grow your money. And you should, you know, pursue that, especially as women, um, because the majority of us are going to be responsible for ourselves financially at some point in our lives. Wow. What an impactful introduction. Oh, my gosh. Um, so that fits right into why I have the entire podcast put together, you know, uh, and then the why of, of the apartment queen and everything. Um, so I'm excited to kind of dig into your story and hear a little bit more. So there's typically three questions that I ask every, uh, guest that we have on the show and I kind of want to maybe throw out some more, but, um, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So the first thing I would like to ask you, if, if you'd oblige us, Uh, is what would you say has been your biggest lesson? Oh, my God. Okay, biggest lesson, never, ever, ever. I have an episode called Never, Ever, Ever, and there's a lot of them, but never turn your financial well-being over to another human being, ever. And that's hard to say because many of us are wives and mothers and have children, and we do that with good men and women who are trustworthy and will take care of you. But statistically, um, that's often not true. Or even if your partner is very well-meaning, that doesn't mean they understand money or how to invest it. And we um, also, again, statistically, unfortunately, tend to turn our financial, especially our um, financial investments over to our spouses, millennials, especially like 54% turn it over to their even though the women are deciding like what house and what car, when it comes to longevity and investing, they usually, you know, kind of, we tend to put our heads in the sand. So don't ever do that. And I say that because I've done that. <laughs> right, right. And I'll, I'll attest to my own um, ability. So my own gut or what I want to do is exactly put my head in the sand on things. Not that I don't want to know. Like you said, you're making those decisions, but I'm just not a detail oriented person. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a bookkeeper. I don't like keeping track of that crap. So, uh, my hybrid model in the adult world of being able to be independent, um, but still be able to do business, but not hand everything over is to hire professionals who are contracted to do those specific tasks And uh, basically they are, as a profession, um, under oath. And especially like, you know, I'm hiring an American person that there's recourse for those things. um, And they don't have access to everything. They have access to specific parts of things that they need um, so that I can't goof those up. Uh, But anyway, because, yeah, I'm as as a nature or or by nature, I don't want to deal with this stuff. I don't, Uh, you know, financials or, you know, I can make decisions. I can press the big red button all day. But like as far as like. I just want to move forward. I don't want to go backwards and like babysit it. So I'm a good hunter, right. not a good farmer. <laughs> and I think that's, a, that's an important distinction because when I say don't ever turn it over, I really mean relationally in in your relationships, uh, your, your husband, your boyfriend, your brother, your whatever. Um, I too am not a CPA and have zero desire to understand it. I too hire people who are licensed and whose lives would be, would hang in the balance should they do something shady. And that's important. And it's really about when we get, you know, in real, typically in our, our relate, our intimate relationships, our husbands, our wives, whatever. Um, and it's very easy to do. And I'm guilty of it as well. You know, I don't want to argue about it. It can get ugly. 
It is the number one reason for divorce is actually finances. And so it's hard to talk about. It's hard. I'm, in a, I'm in my second marriage. We've only been married for a couple of years. We both had our lives established and we have to talk about money a lot. We have six kids between us and assets of our own. And, um, and we're, we're both investors and aggressive. Um, but, you know, we have to talk about it. It's not pretty. You'd rather just be like, oh, it's all going to be great. It's all going to work out. Um, and that's not really true. And for many of us, we don't know who we marry until we divorce them. Uh, yeah, I've heard that a couple of times, a, a <laughs> yeah. handful of times in the last week. Um, could you expand for me on what that means as far as, uh, so that's a romantic or intimate relationship versus a business partnership. Uh, where do you see in that lesson um, how you could maybe apply things that were being utilized in the business uh, world back, back to relationships or vice versa? Um you know, like on a lesson of like what to do. Yeah, don't do it, but how how to do it, I guess, right. Well, I can I can give an example of how I've done it wrong early on in, in real estate investing. And I think this is very true when you're starting out, you're just kind of hungry and you're watching all of these people kill it. And you just want a piece of it. You just, you want to learn, you know, you, you got to get in somehow. And if you haven't learned, you know, from the time you were a baby or whatever, at least this was my story. So there was sort of a really uh, amazing, I'm going to call him a kid because he was early 20s. He was a big star. He was killing it. This was just a few years ago. And I was so hungry to be and to learn and he's very smart that I entered into a deal where he had no skin in the deal. Just and I was thinking, oh, well, it's sweat equity and I'm going to learn so much. Um, so I won't ever do that again. If that's, if that, I hope that's a good example, but just that I only partner with people who put up their own money, have their own, they have to have skin in the game. They have to, but it's very easy to brush that aside when you're trying to learn and trying to get going. Um, but you just can't do that. I fortunately got out of that um, unscathed, but it was, it was a close call. Yeah. It was certainly a close call. That's, that's a good lesson there. Um, now, one thing I talked to a friend of mine about that's um, kind of like my spiritual partner lives in the UK. Uh, I think I was saying something, long story short, our, our conversation kind of gave me a good light bulb, kind of putting those two things together, you know, uh, romantic relationships, business relationships, it's all kind of related. Um, but he, you know, it said to me, I don't understand why people don't uh, apply more of their work principles to relationships. For example, like when you're working with someone at work and you're trying to get them to do what you want them to do, you focus on their strengths, you get them to talk more than you, you, you know what I mean? Like you do all these things in the business world that help, uh, somebody open up or help them, you know, do well at what they're doing. Whereas like at home, I'm guilty of it or have been, or you criticize somebody and then you're negative and then you focus on something that and it just turns ugly or, you know, we're so driven by our emotions that instead of like saying, okay, we have made a decision that we're going to pick these lanes of what we're doing and stay in our freaking lane and, you know, get out of each other's way, just like you do at work. Uh, a lot of the times in romantic relationships, it's just kind of like, bleh, like there's no uh, rhyme or reason or format or, so I actually had a long call recently with a divorce attorney um, who is an apartment owner right around the corner from my house. And so we had a conversation. I was just meaning to get in there to talk about assets and divisions of assets because how does that work and whatever. And I figured he'd talk about his apartment and he did, but I learned a lot. Like I didn't know there was a post nup. I didn't know uh, what, you know, living together, like common law covers, doesn't cover. I didn't know that um, if I owned a business, like an apartment, you know, cause I'm like, well, how do I protect my partners? You know, if you're in an apartment, um, your, uh, your contract or your operating agreement will cover that divorces and deaths and things like that. But anyway, it, there's, there's small things where he, cause he's older had said by experience, there's been times where somebody paid, you know, a spouse something, or they paid an expense a spouse had from an apartment. It was, it was their income, but it like skipped their bank account. And then, so it went directly to them. And because there was a direct line, she was able to claim part of the business. I mean, it was a mess, you know, and I was just kind of like, I was kind of blown away, you know? So I think it's really important to really, like I said, I'm just really wanting to be careful of my assets, but their assets too. You know, we come in here with the stuff that we've created, these relationships we've built, our whole lives, you know, have been put into those things. And um, I think it's only fair if we sit down and have that discussion about like, okay, this is what we have, this is what we're going to do with it. And then, you know, moving right. forward, what are we going to do? 
Right. That's, and that's, I talk a lot about that too, just in general and your relate, whatever your relationships are going to be, whether it's your, you know, your sibling and they're going to be, uh, I agree with you. And I think for me anyway, I've, I've gotten better at this as, as I've gotten older. Um, certainly when there's anything that comes up between myself and my spouse, I usually take a good long time before I actually broach the subject. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what am I really upset about? Cause usually yeah. I go to anger cause that's really comfortable for me, but usually it's a uh, fear or rejection or abandonment that goes way back to toddlerhood. Um, but truly anger is on the menu. Anger is always on the menu. And as women, we tend to ignore that and avoid that. And that's part of our yep. money decisions as well. Right. So I, I like to figure out, am I really angry? And then when I figure out, um, yeah, I'm angry, then I can come in, but you, you can be angry, but yeah. it's what you do with it. I recently had something happen in business that you and I have talked about. I had to take over my podcast and switch production companies and they made it difficult because this hasn't been my industry. I didn't know how angry I should be. So I called like the expert of podcasting, um, the, the vice president of content for Libsyn. And he was pissed. I hope I can swear on this show. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, okay. That's not swearing. And he called them out on Twitter. And boom, I got my content 10 minutes later. Woo. But it's that, yeah, it's that permission. I do that yeah. a lot when I'm talking to people. It's like, let me tell you, you should be angry because we, it, it's, I, I hate to say this, but it's true, but it's part of what makes us great as women. We tend to be like, should I really be this angry? Am I really justified? And then someone comes along who's an expert and goes, hell yeah, you, be- you better be pissed and you better go get what's yours. Yeah, we all tend to do that. Um, if you ever read the book, uh, Women Don't Ask, they cover that in there because we are so um, other centric. So mm-hmm. what we do before we say something or make an action is we think, how is that going to make that person feel? So we hold back and concede for a minute before we actually do the gut reaction. So that's good from a protective standpoint where maybe we don't need to necessarily blow up on someone all of a sudden right away, calm down for a second, let them talk more, something like that. Listen more while you're trying to figure it out. But then sometimes we tend not to act at all or do anything that we need to to protect ourselves because we're so, we're like needing that permission from somebody else um, to do what we know we need to do. So Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm working on that too. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) Yeah. I read that book as well and it's a great book. It's so necessary. It's very depressing. Um, but it really, it really lays it out. And I, I've always advocated for years, like, you know, you have to negotiate your salary up front. You need to go for as high as you can. And statistically uh, us taking less in salary alone, in a day job, a corporate job, equate, equates about five hundred thousand dollars by the end of our lives that we've lost in potential earnings. So I've learned a lot from that book, and and that's one of my mantras. Is I I ask I ask for everything. That's how you and I met. I yeah. asked and was introduced, and and it's it's been great. And I just keep asking until I I, I hesitate to say this, but sometimes I, when I don't get the answer I want, I just keep asking until I find somebody who gives me the answer I want. Same. It's not always the best path, but what I find is there's usually a way around it, like a little trick that we talked about this week, the um, deferred sales trust. Yep. I didn't know what that was uh, till about, you know, 10 days ago. I think there's so, like five answers for everything. That's what I get from my older friends. You know, I've got this friend of mine who's, uh, I call him like my negotiation gangster, like, when I'm, getting, when I'm stuck in a corner and someone's pressuring me, you need to give me an answer now, this, that, and the other, we're under contract, times of the essence, yada, yada. I'm like, you know what? So you taught me this. I'm going to sleep on it, and I'm going to call you tomorrow. Or I will email you tomorrow, or whatever. I'll lay it out there. And then I call, call him, and he's like, okay, so there's like five different things that we could do right now. You know, and gives me like just the outlay of different options. So it's really important to have, um, have that, you know, and be able to... Uh, you had to write that down. That's so good. There's five answers for everything. And uh, the same, I, I tend to, and that's a big part of our, our world right now is kind of that pressure. But if it's important, it's not urgent. And if it's urgent, it's not important, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so very rarely is it both. But I love that there's five answers and I'm going to sleep on it. I, especially in the real estate world, it's oh my like, God. get in now or... 
I'm going to sleep on it. And then like anything to break it up is always awesome. If you've ever read like Chris Boss's Never Split the Difference, or I actually made myself a negotiation guide, like for mediation and stuff. And I really wish that mediation wasn't the way that it is. I'm like, put me across the freaking table from that person. I mean, I need enough rooms. So they can't like whack me, but like yeah. just, just enough room so that I can use my body language. I can get them to tell me everything I need. I, I feel like I'm an awesome negotiator now. So that's a, that's a good one too. Yeah. I've read that book. I love that book. I've had to reread and, it. Ugh, it's hard. Uh, yep. I keep it on audible. It's great. Except I don't like the person who read it because he doesn't read it, but it's a great book. And I took early on, like in my twenties, I took hostage negotiation with the oh, police cool. department. And I swear to God, that has been one of the best skills that I learned. And I used it, I've used it in sales for 25 years. It's truly, because it is hostage negotiation, but you're just like, typically people, they show up to something and they believe you're there to get something from them versus we're just trying to get, and maybe you are there to get something from them, but you, you know, the idea of being that that's not how it has to be. Um, I've seen some really bad negotiators in my life. I like to think I'm a good negotiator, but I also tend to be like, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to climb over my own grandmother for a deal because I like to sleep at night. Oh, you don't have to. I mean, I think that if if you get the right situation set up and you're negotiating, it's more about getting the other person just to like word vomit as much as possible, give away give away all the secrets, all the black swans, all the details, and then like literally when I'm listening to somebody, you're like you know, you're labeling their emotion, you're saying how. How am I going to do that? How can I do that? You're basically making them give you the answer you already had coming into the negotiation that you needed them to get to, but you're like, you're like walking them down the path, you know, and that's yeah. exactly in like this, this legal stuff that I'm dealing with right now. I already knew months ago what the solution was. I already knew what had to happen, how much it was going to cost, whatever, and offered that immediately. And because that person just mentally has not been able to be walked down that path yet, uh, and if we could have a civil relationship, I could have walked that person down that path. But because I'm not going to be disrespected and yelled at and, you know, used and all these other things, I had to put legal distance between us, unfortunately. So that slowed down the process. But, um, I mean, negotiation is essentially getting them to that end goal you're already at anyway, uh, as long as it right. makes sense, of course. But um, anyway, so... Yeah, negotiating is, is, is huge for women. I think that, you know, I actually, uh, one of the book authors on that book, uh, Sarah Lechever, I'm going to have her on my podcast on, uh, in September. That's great. I'm, oh, I'm wow. so excited. Yeah, because That's I amazing. really want uh, several sessions on how to negotiate, you know, f not just for women, but period. You know, as women, uh, more than 50% of households are now becoming divorced households. So women are becoming heads of households um, for the first time or again or whatever. Um, and they're also having to negotiate, you know, for their kids at school, which women are usually great at negotiating for other people. Um, but then like their salaries, um, having to now buy your own house by yourself, having to negotiate your parents, uh, care, you know, things like that. We, you have to do all of it. So might as well just yeah. get good at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a lot of that, I mean, the key to negotiating is just asking, asking for yeah. that. I just am shocked by how much I have received in life just by asking, yeah. just by saying, by, and sometimes I ask a question and this is a visual thing, but, um, you know, I'll be on the phone, ask me a question. I'm like, I'm saying it and I'm cringing at the same time. Yes, I'm like, yes. I can't believe this is coming out of my mouth. And I'm just, do you think you could possibly? And, but the thing is, if I ask, I swear at least 80 to 90% of the time they go, okay. Yeah. You know? Seriously. I just you asked for, it. um, IMS access for free and I got an inside guy working on it. Yeah. He, he didn't say no. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's good. Right. Well, that's could, right. could we at least do it this way? How many units do you have? I'm like, well, we could add this or, you know, whatever. So you make it work. And then, you know, okay, well then I could advocate for you over here and I could, you know, yeah. And I did a training class for their employees uh, last week and they were all like these new kids right out of college wanting to know more about multifamily. So again, you have to give before you get. My older friend was like, don't be doing all this stuff, you know, whatever. And I'm like, you know, I didn't realize that uh, RealPage just bought IMS. I didn't know that. Mm. It's called RealPage I am something now. Um, but same data, same payment portal, same, I mean, everything. Yep. And uh, that was the next step I knew on the next deal I was going to need. It was a very professional portal for investors to get into. So um, I didn't ask, what am I going to get out of this? I just said, I'm going to do this. And then I thought, later something will come back to me. And then when I heard it on, I don't know, the radio or some somewhere, I just heard something about RealPage. It wasn't the radio, but 
whatever. I go, oh, they own that. Oh my God. Okay, so I know that guy, Matt. I'm going to reach back out to him. So just freaking ask it. Exactly like you said, I'm always like on the phone kind of going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they can't, can't see your I'm face. Doing this. <laughs> yeah, they can't see your face. So whatever. Exactly. I can't believe this. I'm doing this, but I'm just going to do it. And, um, and, you know, I find that when someone, if you need help with that, and this is how we can help each other, because it's not like, you know, I can do this always just come off the top of my head. I'm pretty good at it right now. But it's one of the things that people will call and ask for all the time. Perfect example. Another day, uh, this woman called me and needed help with regard to, you know, she has a nine to five job. She's been grossly underpaid for years and years. I took a look at her work and understanding the market, et cetera. And I said, you're, you're earning half what you should be making. She literally had a job interview the next day. She was making 60,000. I was like, this is a $120,000 job. She had an interview and I said, they're going to ask for your salary. And you're going to say, I want to, I want to make between 120 and $150,000. And you're not going to flinch. You're going to write it on a yellow piece of paper. You're going to stick it on your computer. You're going to say it. And she did. And she's like, they didn't flinch. And I said, that's <laughs> what you're worth. Yeah, because but that's that's your anchor. Sometimes. That's your frame of reference. And also, like you said, if you're if, if they ever say anything back to you, like don't concede. Here's the market research that proves or not proves, but you use you reference something else outside of you that it makes it a norm, you know, and they're like, oh, right. Well, OK, well, if that's right. the case, you know. Yeah. Right. I, I said they want you to travel. You're going to be away from your home. You've got this. You've got, you know, whatever. They want you, you know, you're going to be managing a budget and people. Yeah. That's oh six God. figures easily. Six figures to get off the couch. Yeah. You know, um, but she, I think sometimes, and I do this too, I sometimes have to call someone and walk through it. I need the words that I, that I can't get the gumption to say on my own. And sometimes I like literally, this is what I this is what I want to see in a year, and they can go. Ooh, that's over our budget. Well, it depends on the company. If the company's interesting enough, I might you know let's continue the conversations. But don't flinch, don't sweat. Um, easy to say, but easier to practice. Yeah. You know, CBD helps me. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, in that hearing yesterday, are you kidding me? It was like a freaking three hour long hearing. So I was just like, that's perfect. Like a little that's smile, amazing. just kind of relaxed. Hmm. I could yep. I could do this all day, you know. I'm not stressed, mm-hmm. so I think it really helped. <laughs> to tell you the truth. Yeah, um, body language is a big thing too. It's just huge. Just that. That's why this whole Zoom thing is so hard. I had to actually do this with my screen and like roll back to where I could make sure that I could get my arms in the the frame because I want to make sure to use open body language or like when I did a positive thumbs up or. Um, when I wanted someone's attention, I could, I could do this instead of being like this because like, like a, yeah, anyway, so it's, it's so important. So I'm trying to learn how to do that on zoom. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Communi- it's so funny how communicating by zoom is so much more or by any of this teleconference, it's harder. It's, it's emotionally and physically harder than being in a room with people. Okay. So it's not just me. It's, it's, it's incredible. By the end of the day, I'm I'm pretty wiped out, more you know, so than I would be if we did it in person. I've made a limit on Tuesday, Thursdays, doing two podcasts max. That's it. That's so, smart. That's it. That's it. If you want to slide, slide in there, cool. If not, next week, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's smart. Well, Jennifer, really what smart. would you say? So you told us your biggest, um, your biggest lesson. What would you, be your biggest win? Uh, in business, whatever, however you want to answer. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, if, if it's going to be my biggest win, I will say, uh, meeting my husband, I was single for 20 years, um, single for 20 years. I had long-term relationships. I had a seven year date as I like to call it. Um, and by the time I'd met my husband, I had reached a point where I was like, you know what, I'm going to be alone. And, and I'm cool with that because I want a friend. I didn't need anybody to support me, anything. And I thought there's no way, because basically I don't like anybody and nobody really likes me. I'm a lot. (laughs) And, um, I met, I met my best friend. Like we've been in lockdown for a hundred and whatever days. And I give him a lot of grief. Loud salad. Um, (laughs) Loud salad. It's a loud salad every day. It's like a 30 minute loud salad. And the nose blowing is going to put me in an institution. But 
poor dude. I mean, I'm I'm all lightness, man. I yeah. mean, every day with me is just a dream of fairy dust. Um, but you know, at, at at we met, I was 47 years old. Like three weeks into dating, I found out I was going to be a grandmother. I'm like, you're dating Grammy now, and he's he's just perfect. And honestly, I never expected and statistically shouldn't expect to have met somebody who was at the same place. And, and there was a lot of discussions about money, whatever. So honestly, that's, that's my biggest win. It, it wouldn't be business, but my partnership with him. That's awesome. And I mean, at the end of the day, you know, our work is great. Um, but I, have been able to discover some very genuine relationships where I've had lots of surface ones for a long, long time. And, um, it's, I honestly, it's ecstasy, like to, to, to feel that close to someone, to feel that trusting with somebody. Like, so I've got a a couple of very close people in my life. Yeah. I mean, so that, that's an immense amount of value. So even if work goes away or the world crumbles or whatever. Yeah. Yep. That's yep. awesome. And this is this time is really sh- people show you who they are, man. And right now, like it's a real crash course lesson in who people what they're made of. Yeah. Who they are and who they stick by and you know how important your well-being might be to them. Um so it's been it's been really interesting, but yeah. It's it's been great. Yeah. Well, that is it's a very good win. I'm very happy that you guys met, you know. Um, Thank you. So the beginning question I normally ask that I skipped over, I think you kind of already answered, um, but I'll ask it again, just because. Okay. Um, so one thing that the show is kind of about is also being able to show uh, not just females, but anyone listening that, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, a lot of people think that entrepreneurship is this like, oh, you can take time off whenever you want and you get to deduct all your meals and you get to... Uh, whatever, you know, like, like be the big boss, babe. And it's this shiny object, but I mean, in reality, it's, it's different. So like, for example, looking back at how I started, you know, uh, what, what did it look like for you, um, getting started and getting past, uh, getting going? So, you know, bootstrapping it, living with your parents, putting everything on credit cards, getting started, like how, how did the hard work, um, that maybe isn't so glamorous happen? And then how did you get past that? to start getting some, um, motion forward or some traction? Yeah. Um, I would say I'm still an entrepreneur and I still work hard and I still, but I think from the outside looking in, I actually was just commenting. I need to do a post on this because a photo popped up of me 11 years ago and it's a photo of me with this brand new haircut and I'm smiling and I look at that photo and I just want to die. Like it's one of the saddest, most horrible times of my life, but I posted on Facebook and got all these, comments and Facebook is not a reality. Um, but you know, I, I would say I was an entrepreneur on the side. Always. I always had a day job. I had a day job really until November, 2018, uh, when I left it, but how did it start to shift for me really was when I, by using my first, the, the second time I dug out using that house on Airbnb to create an entire second income, nearly equal to what I was earning and then rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. But all of that, you know, wasn't easy. Um, I don't know that I started to breathe until uh, I quit the job and then, you know, had other things shift in the world that the universe was, uh, a friend of mine says, the universe is just testing you. And I said, the universe could suck it because I don't want to be tested. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think even now I've, I liquidated out of those properties and I'm going more heavily into multifamily, but I like in my micro way, I'm kind of doing that in small patches because what I've created is finite. And I started very late. Um, you know, uh, so I think, I think the real sense of calm, though, comes when you adopt the mindset of the entrepreneur. Like, I'm I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be fine. I've worked a whole lot harder and made a whole lot less money than I'm doing right now. And I know how to work hard. I'm not afraid. I know how to network. I can always, you know, I'm scrappy. I'm not, you know. So I think that was really it, just that mindset. And I, it wasn't that long ago that I really believed all I could do was work a job, make money and put it under my mattress or put it in my 401k. And that was my only hope for ever not working for the rest of my life. And discovering that that wasn't true was incredible in making that mind shift. Wow. That, that is, um, 
So how would you, I guess one last question, how would you give a suggestion out to women that um, are listening um, how to do that at an earlier age or how to start shifting that mindset sooner or, or today or yesterday? Yeah, if I were uh, my, if I was giving to myself 25 years ago, uh, I would do a couple of things. Number one, like if I had a corporate job, I would use the tools that are at your hands because they are very useful. There's a lot of back and forth, especially now about like a 401k, but in a lot of ways, a 401k is free money and there's easy way to get um, advice about that. It doesn't have to be the full 20K every year. You could do a little bit less. The second thing I would do is simply put away half my paycheck. And that sounds radical. It's not. Um, and you can't always do that. Like I always know my numbers. Like I knew that I could, when I was raising my kids and when they were little, I knew that we could survive on 40,000. It was miserable. At 60, we could breathe. And at 80, we were cool, you know? So you got to know those numbers. Those would be my things. And then again, just not to turn your financial well-being. You get married and you have a baby and you think, all right, well, you know, I guess he's, he's handling it. A lot of times it's what we do. So those would be, those would be my advice. And then I, for me personally, I would take the little risks, things like if you're seeing, if you're listening to the show and you're hearing about passive income on multifamily, how can you get involved we just, you know this, we just closed a deal this weekend that was 67 doors in Knoxville. It's a $4 million deal. I don't have $4 million. I have 10 partners. I put in a very small amount of money and it wasn't cash. It came from an old 401k, as you know, how we all do that. So that was a secret that I didn't know was available. You don't have to write a check for 50 or hundred K. You could get involved today and learn to understand it. So that's a lot of advice. It's a big mouthful, but I've learned, I've lived a lot of years. You know, you're, you're right. I mean, if you have the resources, leverage them, you know, um, obviously do your due diligence and, uh, education is part of that. I think, uh, in a major way, you know, there's a couple different books I like for passive investing and active, but you know, I've got some people that are in my life where they, you know, are just kind of, they're not ready to, to make that big of a plunge or maybe even my friends from high school, you know, they may have 25 K in a, uh, IRA or uh, something like that where they could self-direct it um, by using the marriage clause thing to pull it out early. And by the way, you can pull it out early of teacher retirement system. You can also pull it out early, like I said, using this marriage clause. There's there's ways to pull it out while it's in your active account. Um, I but, didn't know that. Yeah, but it's all they have. So for me, my, right. my personal rule is that I won't take something that's more than 10% of their net worth. So I, I have to kind of say no, but... Uh, for those that are like, well, I'm just going to not do it until one day when I have the money. Don't do that. Just get started. So another smaller version of apartment syndication as a passive I've done myself um, is investing in house note partials. So I've got a girlfriend mm -hmm. with Capricorn Mortgage, Kristen, who actually um, does the same thing. Is basically they, they buy a house note, which is the, the underlying uh, piece of paper, basically, for the value of the property underneath the physical property. So you're not having to deal with the actual property itself. Um, but that piece of paper is worth so much money. And so as a group, we come in and buy it together. And therefore, you own whatever percentage of that whole note. And every month when those people pay their mortgage, it gets split up to everybody. So, I mean, I think I'm getting like an 8% return on that every month. And it's teeny tiny. You know, I put in like five grand and I think I get like maybe 40 bucks or 50 bucks total a month. It's nothing. Um, but it's something, you know. And because it's That's in right. my IRA, it's tax-free. Um, or my self-directed right. IRA, it's tax-free. So... Yep. There's so many ways in, in real estate that you can get involved and you can make money. Yes, uh, 40 bucks a month is teeny tiny, but an 8% return is very good. And I, I think like you asked about what I would say to, to the younger women, um, to some of the older women like myself, I have a friend I can think of right now. She's in her 50s. She's out of work. She's been looking for work. There's a lot of ageism. It's very hard. Um, to find work and she's very stressed out and her husband is as well. And we talk finances a lot and she's like, yeah, I'm just not really sure to do, but I do have a 401k. It has $850,000 in it. And I'm like, what? I, I, and when I say, okay, look, look, I know you think, I, I know you think this is snake oil, but first of all, I'm not getting any, I'm, I get no money for telling you this, but you don't need to take all of it. Let's just take 100 
and let's get you like a duplex that's earning some cash. You know, let's just put our toe in the, but it's when you've been fed a line, you know, a line of Kool-Aid your whole life, it's really hard to believe. But I think oh, for man. the older women, it's really that you do, like, I didn't know about the the marriage clause or any of that because I quit a job to get my 401k, to get my 150k out so I could make an investment. I hated the job and I wanted to quit anyway. But it was the only way I thought I yeah. could get out. I've got an attorney that can do do those things. Yeah. I always try cool. to figure out loopholes or ways around stuff. So like in ways to get women into multifamily, you know, if you want to be active, you know, if you've purchased, you know, a little house and you have some equity in it and you can pull the equity out, um, you can, uh, or when you have a 1031 exchange, we've come up with a 1031 program. So if you want to skip over trying to go from one door to four doors to five doors to whatever, you can just get into a syndication by doing a tick. Um, and then also the, the trust that we talked about, that's another way, you know, so trying to always kind of have this tool belt of tools, you know, to, to help everybody kind of whatever their situation is, be able to take advantage with that lady you just mentioned, I'm sitting here going, man, if I was her, I'd invest in eight different syndications and they wouldn't all be apartments either. I'd be like, okay, say four different apartments all in Texas. No, I'm just kidding. Um, right. But like definitely one in Dallas for sure. But the point is to test out what is a value play look like? What does a yield play look like? You know, with a certain team that you have, um, the different markets, and then being able to maybe do something in um, light industrial. Um, that's not really mm-hmm. going anywhere. Um, and some types of retail are doing okay. So anyway, but just being able to have somebody else invest your money that has a, a standing track record that you've met and you know, uh, and be able to have them um, invest that and say you're getting like 8% over here, 12% over there, 11% over there. And then that's not including, you know, if you're doing a value play, like what the sale returns are too. So, um, right. man, she could be living right. off of that. Oof. I know. And, you know, the thing is, the, the things that you rattled off, I mean, I know a good chunk of the words that you said, but, you know, seven years ago when I really got started in this, it's like you were just were speaking in Greek. It It is... There is a learning curve and it's so, in, it can be so intimidating, but it's, it's totally doable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it however, 20 decades be after you. So it's totally doable, but I can see where it would be intimidating. And that's kind of where I encourage, like, you don't have to roll the whole 850, honey, but you also don't actually have to go back to work if you do this right. Um, but it's, you know, it's that mindset thing again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, t- there's a lot of people that just got so scared they cashed everything out. Or you're mm-hmm. like my dad and you kept it in and you lost 25% of your um, stock that was at Boeing um, recently and then lost his job. And then I'm actually kind of proud of him because I'm obviously younger than my, my bio dad. I met him three years ago, but um, I go visit them and he hears my mumbo jumbo. Like, it's so funny. All your close fam- for me, my close family members are like, oh, there she goes again, talking about real estate because they don't get it, you know? But then yep. he called me after all this crap has happened to him. And uh, he goes, you know what? You know how you were kind of talking about my 401 and this, that, and the other? You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to buy a piece of land with it. And I go, if you're going to do that, put two double wides on that that land, one on the back side, one on the front side, live in one of them, make sure it has an easement or a way in and out or whatever, and have that person pay for the whole thing. Bam, you're retired. Like, <laughs> yeah. And all he cares about is camping. So, I mean, he'd be like happy as a clam to be able to go to rock concerts and just camp, you know? So, yeah. He's always telling me, oh, I think I'll be another 10 years till I retire. I'm like, Ugh. No, (laughs) that that's what's so incredible about this community, though, too, is that you it's your tribe and either either you get it or you don't. And that it is it is true. Folks who haven't I mean, you don't not everybody has to be an investor. Not everybody has to be an entrepreneur. It's not required. But there is this sense of um, that's all too good to be true. It's not really as they're saying it is. But it's hard work. You know, I'm I'm not. uh, Yes. Yes. I work anywhere I want. Yes. I go wherever I want. But it is hard work. And I'm I'm you know, scraping, trying to figure out areas that I'm not very good at uh, now because I'm in a new realm altogether. But that's every day. And you're taking all the risk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are like, oh, God, a lawsuit. Guess who has to deal with it? The figurehead, you know. So we not only take all the liability and all the heat for everything, but then we have to go. We have to find the stuff. And make the stuff do stuff, and then you know protect the stuff, and then <laughs> uh, yeah. So at the end of the day, when when stuff's going down the can, you're like, all right, I'm here, you know. So 
That's right. I'm here and I understand it completely. And I mean, that's part of it too. Like I, I have certainly, I don't know if you've done this or not, but I've certainly in my life, this time is no exception. I've thought, well, I'm really good at these three things. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to let someone else do the rest. Yeah. And I didn't take the time to learn at least what those steps were. Yeah. That's how you get screwed. Yes. Right. Yep. So you have, that's why in short term rental, I, by running them my, it myself, I knew exactly what I needed. It's why they were so profitable. I saw so many people lose their shirt, They're still losing their shirts. And I'm like, I'm telling you, laundry is important. <laughs> and they can't, they're like, I don't understand. What do you mean laundry is important? I'm like, believe me, laundry is important. And, you know, things you, I didn't think I was going to worry about, you know, house cleaning and laundry and, you know, et cetera. But anyway, that it's, it's really, it's, it's so important. You take all the risk, but we're constantly like, I, I'm, I'm going to be doing this. Silly. I mean, I, 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 I don't really want to work for the rest of my life, but I'll never be turning down these opportunities because they're exciting. And I meet all these amazing people like you and the partners that I meet along the way. And it's a personality type, yeah. you know, like when you, when you go to a CrossFit or a boot camp or all, whatever it is that you do, that's a personality type. Yeah. Right. That goes there and wants that kind of abuse. <laughs> We're, we're weirdos. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, so Jennifer, um, when it comes to getting people a little bit more educated on what to do next or, um, you know, how can they either get in touch with you or do you have any resources that you suggest for somebody who's on the cusp of going, you know, I think I want to take the next step or uh, want to learn more or get involved with your group and be able to invest with you wherever they are. What, what, what can they do to contact and get involved with you? Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing for me, if they want to talk to me directly, is to go to my website, which is www.micro-empires.com, and you can book a few minutes with me. I do do one-on-one coaching, but I really, I'm really specific about it, specific about the type of people. But I'm always interested in 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 helping because I I believe that the more I give, the more comes back to me, and that's true. Certainly, resources I would recommend are probably ones you've already. I mean. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is like the Bible, of course. Um, the Four Hour Work Week changed my life yeah. when it first came out, and I've read it several times since. This book I've been reading a lot. Um, sorry, recommending a lot. I've read it several times. Oh, You're I've heard bad- that. Yeah. You're a Badass at Making Money by Jen Chinchero. This is a mindset book. She's in this story. She's 38 years old and living in a garage, and she's broke, and she finally gets tired, and she has to make the shift in her mindset. It's a great book literally about your relationship with money. And I, I found it very helpful. So those would be some of the things I'm on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, all that, but the website's the easiest way. And on the NHL network under loud salad. <laughs> and hashtag loud Sally. You can see my husband and, uh, and the podcast, Y'all are funny. which you know, is my grandpires. Yeah. My, my husband doesn't do anything that's not loud. It's a little heart. That's awesome. Well, you hang in there. Don't kill each other. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in to Number One Leading Ladies today. This was an awesome session. And, of course, we'll see you again next week on Number One Leading Ladies. Again, Jennifer, you were awesome today. It was great to hang out for a bit and get to – this is really an opportunity to know each other better, too. So a little selfish. But um, if anyone wants to reach out to Jennifer, you heard her how you can. And, I, like I said, we'll see everybody next week on – Number one, leading ladies.